If you haven't noticed, over the last few Sundays, we've been doing more a special type of a message, different than what we do during the week, and I'm going to continue that. On Sunday, special messages related to what I think is important for you to know, and then Monday through Friday, continuing with our study of Moses, and then or Monday through Thursday this week, and then next week, no Bible class from Sunday through the next Sunday. So what we're going to study now is something that has come to my attention lately, and it's something that has, it's very important, and it has really irritated me to think that so many people out of Baraka Church who have uh, been supposedly teaching the Word of God are now going out on a, some kind of crazy binge. And it has to do with face-to-face and non-face-to-face teaching, and it's important. It's important for us to not get into the legalism because a little yeast leavens the whole loaf. And some people say you have to be face to face and they say, well, isn't that just a minor point? No. A little yeast leavens the whole loaf. And that's yeast. I tell you it's yeast and I'll give you scripture on how it's yeast. Being face to face, well, it's a privilege for you. But someone who's not face to face is not a lesser Christian. And I was surprised to hear one of the more famous of the uh, people, I'm not going to give you his name, just know it, because it's going out all over the place, that uh, you can't listen to a pastor who is dead or who has retired, and that's insanity. That is stupid. I won't tell you, if you want to know and you want to know privately, I'll tell you who it is. So you can avoid such a person, and I have a right to tell you that much of it. It does not matter if you're face to face, that is legalism. That's legalism in the utmost form. That's saying by the energy of your flesh you get on your biped, your two feet that God gave you, and by the energy of your flesh walk into a church, and by the energy of your flesh sit there as if that matters, as if it makes a difference. Because unbelievers can sit down and listen and listen for days and days and get nothing out of it. And whatever an unbeliever can do is not the spiritual life. Unbelievers can come to church So we will note face-to-face and non-face-to-face teaching. Now God uses prepared men in the uh, expository teaching of the Word of God. And also God used both non-face-to-face Bible teaching as well as face-to-face Bible teaching. And there are two traditional means of communicating the mystery doctrine of the church age and they've existed since the first century. And both of these means are this. Number one, you can be face-to-face looking at a pastor. Or number two, non-face-to-face outside the local church. In the first century, it was all done by writing. Today, we have technology such as tapes, MP3s, radio, television, etc. Although I don't know any doctrinal teachers on television much. But we have face-to-face teaching, number one. Secondly, non-face-to-face teaching, both ordained by God and both legitimate. Now, why has this become an issue? Because it becomes difficult for any pastor who suffers from arrogance and their own self-importance to swallow the fact that non-face-to-face teaching is not legitimate. Well, it actually becomes hard for them to swallow the fact that non-face-to-face teaching is just as legitimate as face-to-face teaching. They can't swallow that fact because what do they want to see? They want to see faces. And basically what this pastor was saying is, You can't listen to Colonel Theme anymore. He's off the scene. What a bunch of baloney. He got everything he knew from the Colonel and now he's trying to just look at faces and say, no, don't listen to tapes. You be here every day is what he's saying. Legalism. He likes to see faces. He likes to have his ego tickled. Sicko. And that's not just one. There's a lot of them come out of Baraka and teach this nonsense. And what I'm giving you right now is straight from the Colonel's notes. So the colonel would smile at me and say, that's right, boy, if he had enough sense now to do it. You know, he had Alzheimer's. So it becomes difficult for any pastor who suffers from arrogance to understand that non-face-to-face teaching is just as legitimate as face-to-face teaching. Now, there's some problems with both forms. There are problems with face-to-face teaching, and I'll give you a list of four problems related to -to face-to-face teaching. There's problems related to -to non-face-to-face teaching as well. But the first problem is this, the problem of concentration. 
That's a problem in non-face-to-face teaching and face-to-face teaching, but what we're studying now is face-to-face teaching. There's a problem of concentration. For example, if you have a more respect for another pastor other than me that you listen to on MP3, etc., well, you're going to have more problem concentrating on me than on that guy who has his MP3. You just won't have the respect, and maybe I'm not your right pastor, so there's a problem of concentration with face-to-face teaching. Number two, a problem with face-to-face teaching. Number two, privacy must exist. And in small churches like this one, where there are few faces daily, it's hard to hold up privacy, and everybody gets their toes steps on, stepped on, and they think it's very personal because there's so few people. And if it were a congregation of 5,000, you'd have to be arrogant to think I was talking directly at you. But when it's a congregation of 10, well, people automatically think, oop, you're talking about me. But this is the problem, privacy. There's a problem with face-to-face teaching, and that's privacy. And privacy is necessary so that you can receive the teaching of the Word of God under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit, and no one should know your personal life. But when you get a group of people together, privacy is always going to be compromised in some way. Number three, another problem with face-to-face teaching. The distraction of Christian fellowship. And I don't mean Christian fellowship as in fellowship with God. That's true Christian fellowship. I mean Christian social intercourse. That becomes a distraction. Nothing wrong with it, but it can be distracting. Number three, the distraction of Christian, we'll say, social intercourse. And that results in people making people emphasis over God emphasis. And this is a very serious problem. When a pastor says you can't listen to a dead pastor or one who has gone off the scene, he has a person emphasis over content emphasis. I listened to a tape by Lewis Berry Schaefer not too long ago, and I got something out of it, and he's been long gone and dead. But what's the issue? Doctrine, doctrine, doctrine is the issue. The Word of God, not the person or the personality. And when you say they got to be live or you got to be face to face, you're no different than the Israelites wanting a live king. What did they say? They said, oh Samuel, you're getting old. We don't need you, Samuel. We need a king like all the other nations. And so what's happened with a lot of people who have been listening faithfully to tapes, all of a sudden they say, we need a pastor face to face like all the other people have. Yeah, that's part of reversionism and people going, starting to put personality emphasis over what the Word of God has to say. The Word of God is always the issue, always. So that's a very serious problem. And the fourth problem with face-to-face teaching is the pastor's authority often becomes an issue among those rebellious and arrogant face-to-face listeners. Number four, the pastor's authority often becomes an issue among the rebellious and face-to-face members. That is, the the face-to-face members who become rebellious, that becomes an issue because the only thing they want to do is rip down the pastor behind his back. It's a lot harder to do if you're listening to MP3 a thousand miles away. Who's going to care what you have to say a thousand miles away listening to an MP3? You can cuss at the tape all day long, It's it's not going to make a difference. But you cuss at me, it's going to make a difference. See, the, so that's a problem. And if you don't respect the authority of this church, go on an MP3 or do something else. Much better that you get the doctrine without having the trash in your soul of gossip, maligning, and judging because you think some personality is too sarcastic, etc. You don't like it, you don't have to listen. And if you do listen, you don't have to show up. It's as simple as that. It always has been and it always will be. Now there are also problems with non-face-to-face teaching. And non-face-to-face teaching also has its problems. And number one is this. There's a problem of making Bible doctrine a matter of convenience rather than a matter of meeting a schedule. Number one. The problems of non-face-to-face teaching both have their categories of problem, both legitimate, however. There's the problem of making Bible doctrine a matter of convenience rather than the matter of meeting a schedule. 
What I mean by that is uh, maybe your favorite show comes on at uh, 7 o'clock during the week. Don't have time for face-to-face teaching. And so you uh, wiggle it around and say, well, I'll just get it on tape. That is, if you're getting my tapes. I'm not saying if you're listening to someone else. See, we produce uh, MP3s here. You can go on the Internet and you'll say, well, I'll get it later as a matter of convenience and then you don't get it at all. Now, if you had enough self-discipline to actually get it, well, that's one thing. But most people say, well, I'll go fishing, I'll get it later. I'll do this, I'll get it later. And they never get it at all. So there's the problem with non-face-to-face teaching. People don't have their priorities straight. But then again, that's a problem with face-to-face teaching as well. It slices both ways, which means they're both legitimate, and they both have their problems. Number two, there is a problem of making Bible doctrine priority number one and being consistent with it. Number two, the problem of making Bible doctrine number one and being consistent with it. You have to be organized and live a self-disciplined life to be consistent. That is to have self-discipline around the Word of God. Now, you might have a very non-self-disciplined life outside of the Word of God, but as long as you have the Word of God, number one, you're making inroads. Number three. Number three, these are just uh, derivatives of all number one. Number three, there is the problem of concentration and academic discipline. And some people say, I can't concentrate to a tape, but I can concentrate live. Well, I'm glad you're here live then. But you see, some people can listen to a tape and concentrate perfectly. I can. Not bragging, but I know I can. I can absorb it off of, well, oftentimes hear it two and three times, absorb different things each time I hear it. You see, there is a disadvantage to me being up here. You can't rewind me. What was point three again? Point three, the distraction of Christian fellowship. Or I don't like that point, fast forward. You're arrogant if you do that. So there's a problem of concentration and academic discipline. Number four, there's also a problem with authority as well. If you don't like the authority if the, this pastor stepping on your toes on an mp3 you just throw it out the window if your car maybe you're going on vacation listening to some uh, bible tape and he says something you don't like boom out the window well there's a problem there but that problem is less of a problem than if you're face to face that is because you make a scene when you're face to face when you're not you're only making a fool of yourself So there is a tradition for both. There's a tradition for non-face-to-face teaching, and that goes all the way back to the first century of the early church. If we didn't listen to dead people, we wouldn't have the Bible. And just the idiocy of some people, I I can't even believe it. It really did shock me. And it shocked others, too, who heard it with me. So there's a tradition for non face to face teaching that goes back to the first century of the early church. Now we have Epaphras, who was the founder of and pastor of the local church at Colossae. And this is according to Colossians 1.7 and 4.12. But in Philemon 23, Epaphras was serving with Paul in Rome during Paul's first imprisonment. This resulted in Paul writing to Colossae, the Colossian church, through non-face-to-face means the book of Colossians, along with others that aren't part of Scripture. He didn't just write Colossians. He wrote a lot of others that we just don't have as part of Scripture. And this was a non-face-to-face means of writing messages to the Colossian church during Epaphras' absence. Now, the epistle, the epistle to the Colossians is actually the only time the Apostle Paul ever had contact with the Colossians. He did it by mail, through writing. And he used Epaphras as his tape recorder, as it were. Because when Epaphras went back, Paul would write Epaphras, and Epaphras would stand up and read Paul's letter. And since they didn't have a tape recording, he became a human tape recorder. And they would listen to, as it were, him get up and speak face-to-face to the people But then again, it was all straight from Paul anyway. So the fact now Epaphroditus also went to Philippi, but 
the thing is he was not pastor of Philippi he was pastor of the local church of the Colossians and when he went to Philippi he just went there and took the epistle from Paul to that group of believers and this is when he carried to Philippi a series of non face to face messages these were Paul's messages that he carried non face to face to Philippi in this case now the Apostle John also taught non-face to face and face to face. And while the Apostle Paul or John was teaching face to face in Ephesus, he was at the same time teaching at least two other groups in a non-face to face manner. One such group was centered around uh, the uh, second John. And then another group was centered around a, a man named Gaius. And, and that's in third John. But both of these groups are probably in the Lycus Valley, but the point is it was non-face-to-face -face teaching for them. Now John did say in 2 John, I wish to be face-to-face -face with you. Well, of course, but he couldn't be, so he wrote. And then he said, I'll tell you something else when I get face-to-face. -face. Okay, but it does not strike out non-face-to-face -face, the fact that he said he wanted to be face-to-face. -face. They're both legitimate. Otherwise, he wouldn't have even written to them if it wasn't legitimate. It's just common sense. So face-to-face -face versus non-face-to-face -face teaching is actually a false issue because it's not verses. There's not non-face-to-face -face people versus face-to-face -face people. You're all getting the word. There's a man in Germany who orders from me and gets the word. There's people in Minnesota who order from me and get the word. The issue, the issue is they're getting the word. It's not whether they can't come here. This man in Germany, who knows? I don't know his life. He might be in the military. He might be a German citizen. There's no way he can fly over here every night and listen to the word. And yet these idiots say, oh, you've got to be face to face with a pastor. Guarantee you there's probably no, uh, other than George Mueller, there's no one he could go to in Germany. And George Mueller goes through Africa and everywhere else. Where would he get his doctrine? What if you're in Asia? They don't have any great Bible teachers in Asia. Where are you going to get it? You have to get it non-face-to-face -face in those cases. And does that make them a lesser believer? No! It's, it's so much common sense. I can't... It's, that's how legalism is. It is way outside of common sense. It just has no common sense related to it. It's just trying to force people so you can look at their faces as an arrogant man over a large flock instead of a small one. Who cares the size of it? So face-to-face -face versus non-face-to-face -face is really a false issue. The issue is whether or not you're presenting the mystery doctrine of the church age so that believers can execute the will, plan, and purpose for their lives. It's better to get MP3. You see, when I was a young man, I listened to tapes. And I was far better off than hopping around in the Baptist church. Guarantee you right now I was far better off how do you know so much as a young man I listen to tapes that's how I know I didn't fiddle around in a Baptist church if I had done that it would have been a distraction all the little pretty girls would have distracted me all the little pretty Baptist girls so face to face versus non face to face teaching is false the issue is are you growing in grace and in knowledge are you executing your spiritual life the issue is not are you having a wonderful social life? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. Most people go to church for one reason only, social life. Ooh, I miss my social life. What about doctrine? What about the word? Well, I guess you don't care about it. Well, go, in, go on in your social life and you'll find out that the path is rocky and hard. And those people that you think will make you happy will make you sad in a heartbeat and rip you apart behind your back constantly. But see, with doctrine, people can rip you apart and you don't care. In fact, you get blessed for every time it happens. Must be why I'm so blessed lately. So where a pastor covets another man's congregation is when he makes a false issue out of non-face-to-face -face teaching. That's what actually happens. And this comes from subjective arrogance and inordinate ambition and inordinate competition among the clergy. And a pastor may covet another man's ministry and another man's successes. So he will be critical of what? He won't be critical of the pastor because that would be too much. 
he will be critical of his non-face-to-face teaching and his worldwide ministry. Oh, you can't... Uh, look, they'll say, here's a Bible doctrine church here. Why don't you come here? It's none of your business, pastor, why they come there or not. None of your business if they're face-to-face, non-face-to-face. None of your business, man. But they make it their business, and that's because they covet another man's ministry. And I, I guarantee you, if all of you came up to me today and said, you know what? I'm just going to listen to Colonel from now on. I'm going to go home and I'm going to put on uh, my MP3 and I'm going to listen daily. And that's what I want to do because I get more out of it. I would smile and say, good for you, buddy. I would not get offended. But these pastors get offended. And they say, oh, you got a face-to-face thing here. But yeah, a face-to-face with what? An idiot? Yes, in most cases. So a pa- where a pastor covets another man's congregation, he makes a false issue out of non-face-to-face teaching. And no pastor should ever covet another man's congregation. This is arrogance, and it's assuming that you're better than someone else. And guess what? Every pastor is given his assigned congregation by God, whether small or large. God gives him his assigned congregation, and you don't have to go around telling people, you should be here, there, the other way, or the other place. When I went to uh, Nashville, somebody told me, "Oh, there's a doctor. You're a pastor of a doctrinal church in South Carolina." I said, "Yes," and they said, uh, "Well, you need to call all the positive people around there and tell them to come in here." So, look, here, you can come face to face now. You need to get face to face. How arrogant is that? I'm going to stick my nose into somebody else's business and tell them they need to come here. That is, if they want to come here, God will send them. Now, that doesn't mean you can't witness and tell people, here's a doctrinal church, and give them, I'm not saying that, don't get extreme about it. What I'm saying is, you, me as a pastor, I can't call somebody up and say, yeah, I hear you listen to Colonel Thing. Well, I studied under him, so now you come on down here and listen to me. How presumptuous, how arrogant. Almost made me want to vomit when I heard that. Now, there are reasons why you cannot be face-to-face. Now, face-to-face teaching is the ideal way for the communication of the Word of God. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. It is the ideal way for the communication of the Word of God, but there are several reasons why many persons can never be exposed to -to face-to-face teaching. Reason number one, you may be handicapped. I'll even add a reason. I figured out another reason today on the way over. You might not be able to afford gas. And if you can't afford gas, don't bother. You can listen at home. So they are handicapped, number one, in which they cannot assemble with others due to an illness or something else. They may have an illness. Maybe they have a hack and cough, and they hack and cough and cough and cough. That would be such a distraction. Well, stay home if you're ill and listen to the tape and then every time that hacking cough starts, push stop. Stop the tape, hack, throw up, push play again. So there's illness, handicaps that do not allow people to be face to face and you think God frowns on them? No. They still have a legitimate way to learn the Word of God. Number two, their right pastor does not live in their periphery and or no, no doctrine is taught in the area. That was my case living in the upstate. No doctrine being taught around here that I know of, except now. But uh, when I was growing up, this was a hotbed of legalism and still is. Go to Spartanburg, there's no doctrinal church there, it's just legalism. And they just meet on Sunday anyway. And if there is a pastor out there teaching a little doctrine, they just meet on Sunday, and that's not enough to fill me. i got to eat daily. So I did, non-face-to-face. And God did not expect me to buy a ticket to Houston every time Bible doors were Bible class was open down there, and he was my right pastor, still is. So you might not have Bible doctrine taught in your geographical area, And oftentimes, you live in your geographical area. This is where God wants you to be, and there's just no way you can make it face to face. Another reason, if you cannot respect the authority of a local pastor, then stick with your MP3s. That way you won't cause any trouble. 
You see, your right pastor might be someone else. And uh, therefore, you'll never respect my authority. Why bother? If you're never going to respect my authority, which God gives to me, by the way, don't bother. Because the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to cause trouble. And we don't need any trouble. That's all part of point two. Point three. Such people, as I just listed, have the right and the privilege of having non-face-to-face teaching and God doesn't frown on it. And you say, what about Hebrews 5.25? I've taught that in detail. If you don't remember, you can get it on essentials. That's funny because it is basic. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together for the purpose of encouragement. And then you have each other in there. That each other is uh, added and that's why it's in italics. You don't encourage each other. The pastor encourages. And the purpose is for instruction. The purpose is so you can learn doctrine. And that's the whole issue. So God does use prepared men with the spiritual gift of pastor-teacher. And he can use them in two different ways. He can teach face-to-face to a congregation, as I do. He can also teach non-face-to-face to an outside congregation, which I do. It's not large, but there's people out there ordering. Most of them from overseas, which is kind of strange. Maybe there's more positive volition overseas. It's kind of strange. I have this little bitty website, and people from Germany and island countries write. A few people in the States, but it's about half and half, and you just wonder. They find it. What it means is if you're positive, you're going to run into it. And I might not even be their right pastor teacher. They might find me and then they hear me talk about my pastor and say, well, let me hear some of that. And they may switch to him and I'll smile about it and say, wonderful, I'm glad I was your stepping stone. I'm not going to get all upset and say, no, stick with me, buddy. No way would I do that. So in times of deviation from the Word of God, that would be today, in times of deviation from the Word of God and in times of apostasy, non-face-to-face teaching is often the major thrust. It's the major thrust toward the execution of the unique spiritual life because you can't get it in very many places. I think in the 60s, the only man I know of was Colonel Thame. There were a few others, of course. And then people would pick up on his tapes and by 1980, there were a million listeners. Those were the days. Ronald Reagan and all that. That was no accident either. But now we're going down, down, down. In the burning flame of fire. So the primary functions of doctrinal communication continues to be face-to-face. That is primary, but oftentimes you need non-face-to-face teaching. And the only thing that is of importance to you is to make sure you're filled with the Spirit and utilizing Operation Z. And if you're growing in grace and in knowledge, what's it matter? It doesn't. So it's important to remember that authority resides in the Word of God and it does not reside in the means of the communication. Authority resides in the Word of God. Now, of course... God delegates authority to a pastor-teacher and that's important for face-to-face people so they don't go off gossiping, maligning, and judging and causing this big squabble. So I'll tell you something. If you, I don't say you do, but if you gossip, malign, and judge a pastor, especially as adults, I can understand adults getting upset and sometimes being glad with me and sometimes being mad at me. But your children don't understand that. They only see authority. When your children go to school, what they should see behind that um, lectern that the teacher teaches from or behind the chalkboard or in front of it, what they see is authority. And uh, they don't understand glad, mad, all of that. And when they see their authority, their parents get glad and then get mad. You might as well throw my authority right out the window. So the one time you talk about it, it just takes once or a couple times, and that's it. Let's say, well, my parents don't respect his authority. I don't have to respect it either. Well, that's a right. That's a, you know, 
That would be a common logical progression for young people. And, you, and a lot of people just don't understand the impact they have on their own children. It will be evident. Now, authority belongs to God and is only delegated to the pastor who is faithful in teaching the word. And to It's actually delegated to all pastors, but the authority again belongs to the word of God. Or the evangelist who is faithful in accurate communication of the gospel. So congregations are benefited by divine power not by human dynamics. Congregations are benefited by divine power and not by human dynamics. Congregations are benefited by Bible teaching and not by false teaching. There are a lot of problems that I've noted that arise from face-to-face -face teaching that just don't happen when you're non-face-to-face. -face. A lot of things. Well, let me give you, I'll give you three categories just to give you an idea. Give you three categories of something here, something I've been thinking about, something that I probably haven't taught well enough by some of the conversations I've heard. You see, that's a problem with face-to-face -face teaching. I overhear things, or sometimes hear things straight to my face. kind of makes me wonder, scratch my head, what have I been doing? Let's look here. By the way, we're only going to have one class today. I've had a migraine and it just doesn't feel good. So if you're irritated, so am I. We have taboos on the one hand, sin, and wrongdoing. Taboo, sin, and wrongdoing. Now, a problem with uh, one of the problems with face-to-face uh, -face teaching is everybody walks into church with their own little taboo. Everybody has their own taboos, and uh, well, there's all kinds of them. I remember watching on the History Channel a couple of days ago during the Middle Ages when the plague started going around. Well, the Catholic Church decided to go through each town and destroy gambling tables. That's a taboo. God doesn't care about that. And guess what? The famine still continued and the plague still continued. And they got rid of gambling. Taboo. Now, if uh, being face-to-face -face like this, if I go home, start gambling and you hear about it, oh, that's just the talk of the town. Well, see, non-face-to-face, -face, you could hear a tape, I could go home, you don't know what I'm doing. When you're face-to-face -face in proximity with people, you might run into them, see them buying beer or something. Ooh. <laughs> taboo. See? Uh, tobacco. Taboo. Taboo. You say, well, what about uh, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit? Well, stop going to McDonald's, too, then. Take your vitamins. If you don't, you're a sinner. You see, that's not what it means. It's a spiritual connotation. Your health is not an issue when it comes to spirituality. You can be extraordinarily unhealthy and be very spiritual. It's wise to be healthy. I don't discourage it. But these are taboos. These are human things. Human regulations. What did our Lord say? A lot of people got mad when I was going through Matthew. That's because our Lord was tough. What did our Lord say? It's not what goes into the mouth that corrupts what comes out of the mouth. What comes out of the mouth? Gossip, maligning, and judging. So these taboos are inconsequential, but when you are face to face, people try to make it consequential. I don't care what you do outside of these uh, church doors in terms of taboos. Now you can't light up in here, of course, you'll irritate others. But in terms of going outside, whatever you do, I don't care. None of my business. Not even in regards to sin, unless it's gossip, maligning, and judging, then it's my business, because you'll interrupt others. But this is one side, taboos. Can't be a preacher and do this. Well, you can't be a congregation and do this. How about that? Meaningless over here. This has nothing to do with spirituality. 
But when you're face to face, it becomes a problem. People say, ooh, preacher man making my kids go astray. No, he's not. You gossiping all the time is making your kids go astray. Preacher man had nothing to do with it. Besides, as long as you love doctrine, what do these taboos matter? Don't matter to me. Young man wants doctrine? He can get doctrine. Young man gets forced away? Whoever forced him away gets punished. It all goes around in a circle and that's all that matters. Then sin, now that's an issue. That's an issue for the spiritual life. And sin we saw by naming our sins to God. If we name our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And then wrongdoing, out of Kia, the last phrase of that, is worse than sin. Wrongdoing is worse than sin. And wrongdoing includes stuff like uh, socialism. If you get in a thought pattern of socialism or communism, if you go into activism, if you run around holding up abortion signs trying to change the system of our country, you're in wrongdoing. You're in activism. And that's worse than sin because it's so blinding. People get involved in activism and they think they're so righteous. They're way off track. And that's wrongdoing. And it's funny the way people think. They'll get all upset over a taboo. And they'll really wring somebody's neck over a taboo. But then, children go off to college, listen to the professor, become a liberal, become a socialist, become a anti-war activist. You don't think so much about that, do you? But that's worse than, worse than a taboo, of course. A taboo is meaningless. Worse than sin, even. And you might be worried, oh, my children are going to go off to college and they're going to have a drink. Yes, they will. They're getting old. They're going to try some things. Hopefully they don't do any of that stupid stuff like pot. If you do, you'll be punished. Don't try that junk. Don't mess around with that. You want to fry your brain before you even have a chance to use it? You don't need that mess. But you'll turn 21... And you'll be out at a party or something and you'll try it. A drink, etc. Well, that's sin there if you get overloaded. If you get blasted, that's a sin. And that's what your parents are going to be worried about. But you know what I'm more worried about? Wrongdoing! I'd be more concerned if you went out and became a socialist because you've just ruined yourself in the cosmic system, cosmic two. You see, you get involved in this, it's simple enough. Rebound, get moving, get cracking, get out of it, stop it. It's not an excuse, of course. You go, oh, you're giving them an excuse. No way. There is no, no excuse for it. But you can name it. You have an excuse to live your spiritual life. But you get it wrong doing, and it's a long road back. These are deep things of the Word, and you might not understand it, and you might be scratching your head and might be saying, oh, that's just crazy. These are deep things of the Word. You get in Cosmic 2, which is socialism, and you listen to those nutty professors who tell you all kind of crazy things, and you've gone the way of the world. Most people think the way of the world is smoking, drinking, and dancing. That's not the way of the world. Wrongdoing is the way of the world. Again, socialism, communism, activism, trying to whitewash the devil's world getting involved in some type of activist thing to try to do away with abortion. Wrongdoing, wrongdoing. And that's exactly where Satan wants you to be. He wants you to be under wrongdoing so you can make his awful world look pretty. The sin is important, but you name it to God. You name, And when you name your sins, all your wrongdoings forgiven, but most people don't even know what that is. The last part of 1 John 1 9. Don't have a clue. And they're more concerned about a taboo than a wrongdoing. They're more concerned about something that God is not concerned about. It might take a while for this to seep in. We've been over Matthew and we've been over Galatians. It's about time legalism got booted out. If it hasn't been booted out of your soul yet, there's something seriously wrong. There's a hang-up. You're probably just rejecting it. 
And if you're not rejecting it, you're having a hard time somewhere. There's a hang-up. You walk out of here and go right into sin and then forget everything that was taught. After going through Galatians, there should be no more legalism, no more wondering about taboo this, taboo that. Besides, what people do is none of your business anyway. Unless they're your children, of course, then they are your business. Anyway, this is what we're dealing with here. and We just uh, closed up with the face-to-face and non-face-to-face teaching as part of this special. And the reason I bring it up and the reason I get so fired up about it is it's one of those things that uh, Satan's really pushing for. He's really trying to pull people away from the foundation. And the foundation was Colonel R.B. Thing Jr. And I'm not praising a man, I'm praising the doctor. And he taught. And he did it correctly, systematically. Systematic theology. And he did it with precision. And if he ever was wrong, he fessed up to it and said, Oh, I taught that wrong, let me give it to you right. And uh, many pastors are going away from that, trying to make their own road. You can't build on that foundation. You can build on the foundation, but uh, you cannot build your own structure. You can't uh, go out and uh, start uh, injecting legalism into it. And that's all that is. To say you have to be here and look at my face to hear me, that that somehow makes you holier, or that somehow you cannot listen to a pastor who has either retired or has died. Nonsense. The Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, of course, I can talk to you about some current events that I do every now and then. And of course, it's a pleasurable. And if I'm your right pastor, this is where you should be. This is where you should be to get it. And if you're growing faster now than you ever had, then you're in the right place. But it's you go with the person who gives you the best spiritual growth. That's your right pastor. Whomever you grow the fastest under is your right pastor. If you say, I grow faster at the Baptist church, you're lying, but you go right ahead. If you say, I grow faster at the Methodist church, or even better yet, if you say you grow faster at the Episcopalian church, under a homosexual pastor or a woman, you go right ahead. By the way, they've ordained all of that. They've ordained a uh, homosexual priest, I guess they call them, and they've ordained a woman. That's just contrary to the Word. We know that from many scriptures. And things are going insane today, and there's a huge satanic attack on a legacy, the legacy of my pastor. And he's left a legacy, and instead of pastors being humble enough to get up and say, you know what, I got all my information from this fellow, and I do have a congregation, and it's God's appointed congregation for me, and I don't need to go off half-cocked to try to get pull people in here through some taboo or legalism. If you should respect me for anything, it's, I'm not looking for any type of glory. None. If I were a glory seeker, you would have found that out a long time ago. Not a glory seeker. Don't give a rat about what people think. I care what God thinks. And in caring what God thinks, of course, uh, there will always be hearers. Sometimes three, sometimes more, sometimes none. And then if it's none, I have to do something else, and that's fine, too. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning what we've noted, and may we come to understand that the issue in all of this and the issue in our lives is not personalities, definitely not taboos. The issue is the Word of God. In the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior, amen.